Well, I'm so grateful for Chris Proft last Sunday to fill in for me um, and just heard great reports on his message and touched people's lives. And what a blessing it is for me to have some men in my church that study the Word of God and are prepared and can, you know, cover me when, when I can't cover myself. One of the things I'm learning about this leukemia that I'm dealing with is that I guess my body is constantly fighting um, in the blood. And so it leaves me vulnerable to, to sinus infections and colds and um, I had a tooth get infected that they pulled out. But the infection, instead of just being taken care of, went through my whole body. And uh, I swelled up. It looked like somebody hooked me up to an air pump and filled me up almost 12 pounds of fluids um, and spasms and it was bad. I was kind of hoping I could get to heaven uh, just a week ago and I ended up in emergency on Saturday and they uh, put me on some different things and got me home and very made me keep my feet up for three days which almost killed me. Um, I looked at my lawn every day and go, I gotta mow my lawn, I gotta mow my lawn, I just need to mow my lawn. Poor, poor little Sabrina comes over and she mowed my lawn for me. <laughs> um, but it's amazing that a week later, you know, God's good and sometimes you gotta feel really bad to remember how good it is to feel good. And uh, so God always wins in situations. My prayer during the week is that Sunday would be my strongest day of the week and God's been real faithful in that. Uh, Ephesians. We're in chapter five, and we're only gonna look at half of it. Like I said, these, these chapters are so important. I don't wanna load us up so much we forget anything about them. And again, just a little reminder, the first three chapters are all about who we are as God's children, the privileges of being God's children. It's amazing what we have as God's children, and just a reminders of that. Then the next three chapters deal with, because of that, this is how we should live. And the first part's so important to the second part because if you just jumped into the second part, pretty much you'd become a legalist. You wouldn't understand why you obey God or why you should live that way. You would just live under a bunch of rules. But understanding how God loves you, what's waiting for you, heaven waits for us, and what we are as his children should have us want to be the next three chapters, not because of a set of rules, because of what we have in Christ Jesus. And so it's a very balanced book and it's one of my favorites. I happen to like the second part because I wanna know what is that supposed to look like, God? You know, because of what you've done for me, what, sh what, what should I be doing? And, and that's what I love. And again, it's because I want to please him. I wanna do the things that he wants. I wanna make him smile. You know, I, I had a friend who, um, <clears throat> falls off the tracks, he just does. His childhood, it's amazing to me that he functions. It's hard to believe, I, I lived in love. I, I can't even comprehend the childhood that he had and what he's gone through and he self-destructs. And he'll do really good for about three or four months and then I'll get the phone calls. And the last phone call was that, you know, can I take my life while I still get to heaven? And, and, and it's really hard to, drink, to talk to a drunk person. You know, it's hard to make any sense or make any connection at all, but you know, he's just ranting and he's just screaming the pain, the pain, the pain, and he's in pain. It's like someone's wounded. And um, just talking to him, learning that I have to be more quiet than speaking, and then he gave me just this little opportunity and I'm going, the only sin I know of is that rejecting Christ. But the point is, do you want to stand before God and say you cut it short? Do you want to come stand before God and say that you didn't finish? Do you want to stand before God and say that you, know, you, did, you, you lost the opportunities that he's given you? And reminded him you know, of some of the things that he's done amazing when he walks with the Lord. And then you know, he hangs up. And then um, I get a picture of his wrists that are just slit. And I mean, just comparatively look at the pictures. And then he hangs up and I don't know how to reach him. I don't know how to get to him. I am sick as a dog. And I'm up all night just losing my mind. And I just had to come to the place where I'm going, Lord, he's yours. 
I, I don't have a way to going and getting them. I don't know who to call. I don't know what to do. I, I need to rest in, in that, and I just need to hand him to you. And, you know, it's, it's what you have to say, and then you have to follow through with that. Um, I can't say that I went back to sleep, but um, I did find out that he, they, they got him. They 51 50 would him. Um, he's sobering up, and he has another opportunity to serve God well. He can. He's possible. He has, great, he has gifts. You know, um, the only way the enemy ever wins in any of us is when we quit. You've heard me say it, and it's the absolute truth. Now, it starts out in chapter 5, verse 1. It says, imitate God. Now, when Paul talks about imitation here, he was using a language that the wise men of Greece could understand. Imitation was the main part in training of a public speaker. The teachers of public speaking said that the learning of public speaking depended on three things, theory, imitation, and practice. The main part of their training was to study the imitation of the masters before them. It is as Paul said, if you were to train to be a public speaker, you would be told to imitate the masters of speech. Since your training in life you must imitate the love and forgiveness of God. Paul uses things in their place and their time to help them understand what he's saying to them. And so we come to this word therefore again. It says, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. And as silly as this sounds, when you see the word therefore, you have to ask yourself, why is it therefore? Well, it's taking us back to the last chapter. And it refers to where Paul was saying, forgive one another because God has forgiven us. Do it for Christ's sake. In other words, Paul's saying, it only makes sense to do what God did for you, and that was to forgive. And so he goes back to that thought. Second verse, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. The sweet selling, um, smelling aroma refers to, refers to Leviticus 1 through 5, where we see the burnt offering, the meal offering, and the peace offering. And they're all called sweet smelling offerings because their aroma was sweet to the Father God. So when you choose to follow Jesus, his example, by sacrificing your rights, by walking in love, it's a sweet smell to the Father. Well, they did this. Well, they did that. Well, they deserve this. They did that, deserve that. If you say, I've been forgiven so much, I need to forgive you. I don't have to win every situation. I don't have to be right every time. Grace is an amazing thing to give others. And I think if we have the right perspective, we can do it. Without the right perspective, we don't stand a chance because we'll always go, they deserve that. Or we have the right to do that. And God had a better right than anyone to just nuke us. And his long suffering, and his grace, and his faithfulness, they should be examples of us. That's what Christianity is called to. Verse three, let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed. Isn't greed a different word there between those two things? Among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. We're God's people, and we're no longer to belong to the world of darkness that's around us. We've been called out of darkness into the marvelous light of God. It's beneath the dignity of a believer to indulge in sins that belong to the world of darkness. And Paul named some of them here. He warns us against sexual sins, fornication, sexual immorality. This is any form of sex between two people that are not married to each other. Um, I, I, the question comes up, how far can we go before it's too far? The Bible says very clearly, any sexual act between two people that are not married. He makes it very clear. It was very common in that day. And today, it's so common, it's ridiculous. I have some friends that are single. 
and dating is almost impossible for them, male and females, because society and what society says, what every movie you watch, you know, I mean, everything that's on television. Now, as I said, greed seemed out of place to the fornication when you look at that. But the two sins are different expressions of the same basic weakness of a fallen nature, an uncontrolled appetite. The fornicator and the greedy person each their desire to satisfy their appetite by taking what does not belong to them. 1 John 2.16, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes would describe these two sins Paul talks about. The Bible tells us don't even let there be a hint of these sins in your life. It goes on to hit us in places that we need to think about. Verse four, obscene stories, foolish talk, coarse jokes, they're not for you. You know, that's one of the hardest things about being around those that are unbelievers. Their language, their jokes, their, you know, the the, the off-colored things. I'm not talking about something that's cute or simple. I'm talking about just flat-out filthiness. It says filthiness, foul talking, coarse jokes. They open the door to fornication, unclean. They, 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 They try to make things seem normal or common. And that's what's being talked about in verse three. Anyone watching society knows what once was a thing that would cause people to be blushing is now just normal in our society. Now the gift of wit is a blessing, but when it's attached to a filthy mind or a sinful motive, it becomes a curse. There are quick-witted people who can complete, they can completely pollute any conversation with jests that are just out of place. Many times the so-called humor is only one way to justify a less than a you know, holy lifestyle. I um, have a story of um, an embarrassment to me. When we first started the church, we were trying to find things we could do with the church. And my, my sister grew up and my brother-in-law with this amazing, world-famous comedian. And he's very talented and he was coming into town. And whenever my sister was gonna go to one of his shows, he promised Sherry that he would clean up his act. And so I hear about this, my sister calls me and says, I can get you tickets. So the church is only like 15, 20 people when we started. And I said, hey, I love comedy. My sister knows this comedian, there's, there's gonna be at the comic store, there's gonna be a, a show and we, we can all take the church and we can all go and, and we can go to the comedy show. And so everybody was excited, I invited the whole church to come and a bunch of them came and the place was packed and I was at the head of the table that was pushed all the way to the stage, maybe three or four feet away. And then people, I don't know how they got out if it was a fire. And so what we didn't realize that my sister's friend was a comedian, there was four or five other comedians that were coming before him. And this one guy gets up there and he is the filthiest, foul-mouthed, lewd person I've ever heard in my life. There was not an inch of humor in anything he said. And I'm sitting there going, how do I get out of this room? How do I save the church? That's all I could think. And I can't get out of the room. I've got all the people in my church sitting this way and they're looking at me like, what did you take me to? And all I could do at this point is just put my head down. And I've got my head down like this. And he goes, what's wrong with you? He picks me out of the cardio. And my brilliant wife goes, he's a pastor. (laughs) The guy... The guy went off on pastors for 15 minutes, it seemed like. I'm sure it was three, but it felt like two hours. I I wanted to die. It's like one of those moments if you just get on a jet and go away. Um, My sister's friend got up there and he did a brilliant job and it was hilarious. But just the filthiness and what people consider funny today. It's, it's, you know, they used to have the Dean Martin roast and and they, they were clever and funny. The roast today, you can't watch them. You can't, I mean, the, the filthiness of the world, the way that it is. And what happened to Tim Conway and, and, and those kind of guys that were just, they never a cuss word came out of their mouth. And you, the Carol Burnett show, you laugh till you fall. But you see how the world has progressed. The, the frog in the water. 
You know, you put them in a cool pot of water and, it'll, and you can turn up the heat and that frog will sit there till you boil it because it doesn't feel that at one moment. And we're just like that frog in the pot of water. It's just turned up and turned up and turned up. And if we're not living as Christ, we just boil with the rest of the world. Verse five, the things your pastor gets into. Verse five, you can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For the greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. Paul makes it clear the people who are deliberately and persistently live in sin will not share in God's kingdom. I mean, it's really clear. It speaks to someone who practices fornication, illegitimate sex. The immoral, the greedy, the fornicator, they're gonna be judged. Paul equates covetousness and idolatry because it's the worship of something other than God. These things, these warnings deal us with the habitual practice of sin is what he's speaking of. It's not talking about the person that falls here, falls there, is sorry for what they did, didn't think about what they got into. We all fall short. But this is the person that says, I know what you say, God, but I'm gonna do what I want anyhow. That's, a, that's habitual sin. That's the one that you don't get to go to heaven if you're living in. King David committed adultery, had a man killed, and yet God forgave him, took him to heaven. He repented, he went his way. He didn't live in that type of life. Certainly David was disciplined for his sin, but he was not rejected by God. We don't ever want to get someone to think that because they failed somewhere that they, don't have to get, they won't get to heaven because none of us would. But it's talking about, see the problem is, is that if you can habitually sin, you've not made him Lord of your life. You don't tell the Lord of your life no or I'm not gonna do what you say. Now again, you can make a mistake. You can ask for forgiveness, we all do. But if you're living in that type of sin, you're, something's wrong in your relationship with God. He's not Lord. Verse six, don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. It's amazing to me when I meet with people how they justify sin. You know, in their mind, they've, they've made a way that their sin is okay because of this or because of that or for some reason other than what God says. God doesn't take those excuses. Now, in Paul's day, there were false Christians. The heresy was called Gnosticism. And they would argue that believers could live in sin and get away with it. These deceivers had many arguments and convinced them, ignorant Christians that they could sin repeatedly and still enter the kingdom. They would say, you're saved by grace. So they would go ahead and sin that God's grace might be abound. Paul answered that foolish argument in Romans 6. Sin in the life of a believer is different from sin in the life of an unsaved person. It definitely is. It's worse because we know better. God judges sin no matter where he finds it. And he does not want to find it in the life of one of his own children. I personally believe that no true Christian can ever be lost. But they will prove the reality of their faith by their obedient life. There are many that claim to be Christians, but they've not made him Lord of their life. Matthew 7, 21. A Christian is not sinless, but they should sin less. You know, we should be different today than we were yesterday. We should be better than we were before. We should sin less in our life. The Christian is called to a higher standard. If you want to be called a Christian, it means you're going to live different than you did in the past. Verse 7, don't participate in things these people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So, Live as people of the light, for this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. You know, the fruit of the Spirit 
or the light is in goodness and righteousness and truth. It's impossible to be in darkness at the same time. The light produces goodness. Goodness is love in action. Righteousness means righteousness character before God and righteousness of the actions before God and people. Both these qualities are based on truth, which is in agreement to the word and the will of God. We don't make excuses for doing what's not in the will of God. And I, I, find, I find human beings doing that. I find my nature wanting to do that. Justify it. Justify, well, I can do this because, you know, the government's not really good or this or I can do that or you do these battles and then you fight back and forth and then you finally just give in and do what God says and go, why was I doing battle? It's so much easier when I just obey God. Jesus had a lot to say about light and darkness. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And in John 3, 20, all who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. To walk as God's children of light means to live before the eyes of God, not hiding anything. It's relatively easy to hide things from other people because they can't see our hearts and minds. But in Hebrews 4.13, it tells us, nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the one whom we are accountable. You know, every time I get on an airplane, I am required to have my luggage and my body to be inspected. I've never been afraid to walk through the detecting machine. It's there to keep people from bringing bombs in. I know as I stand before that machine, I have nothing to hide. Your and my life should be like that. Your and my life should be like that. We should be able to stand before God and not have to think that anything we're doing in our life needs to be hidden. And the Bible tells us right there before, nothing is hidden. God is the ultimate x-ray machine. He sees every thought, every action, everything that you're doing. I wanna stand before him with nothing to hide. Verse 11, and take no part in the worthless deeds of the evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It's shameful even to talk about the things the ungodly people do in secret. But their, evil, but their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. For the light makes everything visible. Walking as children of light means we revealing God's light in our er everyday lives. Our life should shine through everything and everybody that we meet. Not you and me, that's our flesh. It's the spirit of God. It's the light of God that should show in our life and our actions and our grace and our forgiveness and our kindness and for others. By character and our conduct, we bring God's light into a very dark world. And as God's light, we help others find a way to Christ. What you do has a thousand times more power than what you say. You can tell people how good God is all day. If your actions don't line up to that, all you do is talk. It doesn't mean anything. The mind of an unsaved person is blind. Satan has them under control. It's, and, 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 and that's why sin is so easy in their lives. Only as we witness and share Christ to them does the light enter many dark people. It exposes, it exposes what's wrong. You know, no surgeon would operate under a dark room for fear that they could harm someone or make a mistake. No true artist would try to draw a picture in the dark. It takes light. Light reveals truth and exposes true character. This explains why the unsaved person clearly stays away from church and the Bible. 
God's light reveals their true character. It exposes a not very flattering place in their life. As we Christians walk in the light, we refuse to fellowship with those that live in darkness. We expose the dark things in their life. It always will be a challenge and always be a problem. This is why it's said, the Bible goes to say, aware, O sleeper, rise up from the dead and Christ will give you light. This light makes us different. Paul's saying, wake up. Look what's happening in your lives. I know too many people who could have turned this world upside down for the Lord with gifts of personality and and helpfulness and other, you know, just wonderful gifts that God had given them that they never used. They could have been used for the kingdom mightily, but because they weren't awake to the word of God, what it said about filthiness, uncleanliness, fornication, pornography, They were just filled with their lives with entertainment and material things and they were ineffective towards the kingdom of God. And it's such a waste. Man, such a waste of this opportunity you have and I have every minute we're on the face of this earth. Goes on to say in verse 15, so be careful how you live. Church, this speaks to us. We need to be careful how we live. Do we look more like the world or do we look more like God? It's so easy to follow the ways of the world, but it's not the ways of God. Be careful how you live. Don't live like fools. What does God call the people that don't live like him? Fools. The creator of heaven and earth. He's calling them fools. But be like those who are wise. You know, God sees greediness and filthiness and cleanliness and fornication and pornography as a life of fools. And if that's what he sees, we need to recognize it. We need to take it seriously. Verse 16, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't get so hung up about how evil the world's turning I know for most of my conversations with all, most of my Christian friends, we spend too much time on talking about how rotten the world's become. And it's hard not to, you know, especially if you're watching that idiot box 24 hours in the news. You know, it's hard not to. We've watched in our lifetime things move so wickedly fast that it's hard not to spend your thoughts and process of the night. But that's not what the Bible tells us to spend our time. It says, make the most of every opportunity in these evil times. You know, recognize what's going on in the world and recognize how critical it is to share the good news, that there is hope, that there is eternity, that the Christian life is a better life. That's what we're called to. We redeem the time by bringing the Lord in to all that we say and all that we do. And I'm not talking about being a Jesus freak or a weirdo or whatever but you can very wisely bring the hope of God into any circumstance with intelligence. Anything that we do that doesn't have a spiritual texture is really kind of a waste of the time that we have on earth. A lot of people get nervous when they hear this. Does this mean I I shouldn't have a motorcycle or drive my boat or go on vacations or even play cards? No, do all those things. Just look for opportunities to share the light of Christ in those things. Verse 17, don't act thoughtlessly. And the word, if you look it up in the original language, foolishly, unwise, without reason, stupid, without intelligence. But understand what the Lord wants you to do. Worship team, would you come up? You know, what is the will of God? First and most of all, it's to trust in Christ. And then we're to walk in purity. And how does that work out practically? Well, we looked at some of those things in the first part of this chapter. That the Lord doesn't come between now and next Sunday or I don't drop dead. We'll take a look at that. We'll take a look at that, Lord willing. 
I, I love this book. It says it's so simple. It says it, and, and I've just found so many Christians that are not living under the fundamentals of God. They want to go off on this tangent or that tangent or, you know, and, and they just, if they would just live like this, everyone around them would be recognizable. You know, they would, they would see God in every one of their circumstances. It's what we're called to do. And I don't think that you and I can do that without the power of God. His Holy Spirit that lives within us. I don't think in our flesh we can do that. We'll find too many ways to justify our anger or our sin or discontentment. It's only through the power of God, the realization of who he is and what he's done. This book does such a phenomenal job of that that helps you and me do right when we live in a world that it doesn't seem like anyone else does. I remember the last years of running my company as electrical and general contractor. I had made the comment that I felt like it was the only contractor on the face of the earth that did what they said they were gonna do and wasn't a crook. I became so disillusioned of the construction trade. The amount of flakes that were out there, people that made promises that never followed through, people that were taking advantage of people. When we were doing the Starbucks, there were 12 different contractors involved in the store. And it felt like we were the only ones that would do whatever it would take to make the job come out on time. And then because of that, we got taken advantage of because they shortened our schedule to make up for the other contractors that weren't meeting the schedules. It just felt like nobody else was doing it. And you think, why do we work so hard when no one else does? Because we brought light. They knew that we were different than anybody else. They commented, even the ungodly, that we were different than other people. And we did it through the power of God. We did it through the power of God. And the same thing you're called to where you're at and what you're doing in life. This isn't a message for pastors to follow. It is a message for pastors to follow. But it wasn't written for pastors to follow. It was written for us human beings to follow. Would you stand with me? Mm. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May your week with him be sweet and tender. Father, quiet us down. We pray every week. Help us to hear your voice. Don't let us get out of bed. Don't let these feet touch the ground, Lord, until we... We've asked you to fill us with their Holy Spirit, enabling us to live a life that looks like this, Lord. You've showed us what it's supposed to be. Now help us to let it be, Lord. And I know we have to be obedient, Lord. But we know from that the power comes. Bring your Holy Spirit on us, Lord. Give us the strength to live a life that looks like the life you lived. And we know it can only happen through you, Christ Jesus. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.